Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, everybody still awake, more or less? Um, let, let's see if we can uh, make this kind of scary enough in terms of failures uh, to keep everybody awake. Um, so the topic is, why is it always DNS, TLS, and bad configs, which um, hopefully makes sense to everybody who is here. Otherwise, at some point, you might say, ah, yeah. I kind of remember that pattern because my, in my mind, how, how that looks like is, um, I'm not sure if you remember Harry Potter, but there was this scene when McGonagall was asking like, why is it always the three of you when something happens? And that's pretty much where I see DNS, TLS, and bad config sitting there. And maybe they're just a bit of a side effect when something bad is happening, but that's kind of the common trend that, that you see in IT, that whenever there is an outage or something is broken, it's one of these three is not far, or maybe all of them combined, just like in Harry Potter. So um, I was looking at example for DNS, um, and I took an example from Akamai where they said like, well, we made the DNS bad configuration and everything disappeared. And I'm, I have my own anecdote for that. Um, and I'll ask at the end who recognizes themselves in that. So uh, a while ago at one of my previous jobs, um, we were moving DNS servers. And we were moving, moving I think, back then from Gandhi to AWS. Um, and we had different names. And every domain name has its own set of DNS servers. Um, but I made the stupid mistake. And I copied the DNS server of the first entry for all of the DNS servers. And I think the time to live for our DNS servers was 24 hours. So as you can imagine, at first everything works perfectly. And we did that, I think, on Friday evening or Saturday morning. So, <laughs> so, it's, um, so it's kind of like when not much, ha much is happening. And then on Sunday, we woke up and we could basically watch how our stuff was disappearing from the internet once the, the TTL was propagating in terms of DNS. And then we, we can only watch because the TTL is 24 hours. So <coughs> um, then we fixed it and waited for it to reappear. Um, so that was kind of like my story of how DNS can be tricky, especially with the time to live. It's like sometimes you can just helplessly watch um, and don't make stupid copy-paste errors. Um, does anybody have a similar story of DNS that they did something similar? OK, a couple of hands. Yeah, that's, I guess, how, how you learn and how stuff happens. Um, and then. TLS is another one of these classics. Um, who never had a TLS ex certificate expire on one of their production systems? There's just very few hands going up um, because it's, it's a very a recurring thing. And I could count or have countless examples for where it happened. One of my favorite ones is that Gradle plugins had a TLS. Um, well, it, it expired unsurprising, in November 21. And there was this uh, discourse thread around it. And what was funny is that exactly one year later, on November 22, they had the same issue again. <laughs> so that, and, and we'll see what will happen in November of this year. Um, so, so, so maybe there was some learning at some point, or, or it's, maybe it's just user-driven. I think there was this old um, saying of, about Microsoft that Microsoft doesn't test software. They release it and wait for you to report bugs. And this is kind of like the same thing with DLS. You can basically not monitor it, and you just wait for users uh, to report them. And maybe that's their approach here. And then you have bad configurations. Um, there was the one big Facebook outage where everything disappeared. Um, which was a while ago. And looking at you, most of you look old enough to remember Facebook, because when you talk to the students nowadays, nobody uses or knows Facebook anymore, basically. But for the old generation, Facebook is still a thing. And it, it was kind of like a, a big thing when it disappeared. And DNS was kind of like the thing that was seen first that disappeared. But it was, in the end, a bad configuration, where I think they had a health check that was checking something, and that check was wrong. And then it stopped uh, advertising the PGP routes, and then everything just disappeared. And again, it took quite a while to, to fix that. And allegedly, because everything at Facebook is driven by APIs and the Facebook <laughs> platform, um, I think that the legend has it that the access to the server room was also controlled by something that depended on that DNS lookup. And they, they dropped the, the DNS um, entry, basically. 
And allegedly they had to chainsaw their way into the server room to fix it. Um, but I'm not sure if that is an urban legend or really happened. But it, it sounds very believable that bad configurations can have those effects. <coughs> um, the funny thing is, Cloudflare is always very good about writing these blog posts. And they had a, an explainer about the Facebook outage back then. Um, the funny thing is, not so long after, they, they had a, their own outage around that, where they had we're trying to fix a long-running stability thing, um, and that took down everything in their network. And uh, the unfortunate thing for them was that they made the change, and everything looked good. It's almost like the TTL story. But then they have a couple of core components, which they call spine, which serve most traffic. And they triggered a bug that was only there in the spine. So they rolled it out on the smaller regions, and everything looked like it was working. And once it hit that spine, like the, the busiest um, the locations, then everything started dropping. And only then did they detect it, roll it back, and fix it, and figure that out. Um, so coming back to Harry Potter, um, there is this thing um, that they call the, the Horcrux. And I, I think DNS, TLS, and bad configurations are, are almost like the Horcrux um, of IT. Um, they, the things that are sitting there, and we can't live without them, but we also have to live with them to some degree. Um, so how do you take out the Horcrux? Or what was the solution in Harry Potter? Yeah, you basically fight, I don't know, fire with fire. Or you had something to, to fight them. And in the, the case of Harry Potter, um, you had this magic tooth uh, from the snake, I think, that you could use. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the magic tooth of snakes. So my, my take is that the, the magic tooth that we have and that we should maybe use more is or are health checks to fix stuff like that. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a quick overview of, of how I think or how my mental model is. We can have a discussion afterwards if you agree or disagree or think it should be done differently. Um, but I think by having health checks, so basically, uh, is this thing up and is it running? Um, and if you structure and combine them the right way, you can actually detect things a lot quicker um, than just waiting on your users. I mean, waiting on your users to shout is also a, a way of alerting, uh, but maybe it's not the way you want to be alerted. Um, so you could structure it in a way that you have some health checks outside of your system to check it from the outside. You have it on the network, and you have it potentially even on the host for health checks. And as you build those and see kind of like where stuff is failing, you can pinpoint the problem relatively quickly and easily. Um, so from outside the network, it's kind of a made up example. But let's say we're hosting on AWS. And I put my health check on DigitalOcean. So I can check from the outside is, for example, the DNS lookup working. Is the upload, uplink of AWS there? Or can I even reach? that provider from DigitalOcean or some other region. Um, did I configure the firewall correctly on the outside to my application, or am I dropping the, the traffic there? Is my load balancer active and serving traffic correctly? Is the service itself running, and how is the latency? So I can also compare the latency to on the inside of the network. And with these signals, I have a, a decent overview from the outside. It's more like the user's perspective, where I can say like stuff is failing or not failing doesn't tell me yet so much about the insights. Once I'm, I'm in the network, I could, for example, test across availability zones um, that I have in one availability zone, my health check, and I then check that the network within the cloud provider is working as expected, because sometimes the network drops there, um, because whatever router or switch exploded on their side. Um, did I configure the, the firewall correctly on the inside? Um, you could have TLS checks for valid certificates here or on the outside even. Um, I can check if the service is available here, and how is the latency. And for example, the last two points in comparison to the previous slide already give you a good indicator. If you can only reach the service on the inside of the provider, then it's probably something to the provider that is causing the issue. Or if the latency here is much lower than on the outside, then it's kind of like an uplink problem, potentially. Um, whereas if it's working within the network's provider, then at least you know, is it the cloud provider to the outside, or is it in my service? You could also have like the service check on the instance itself. So you can check on the instance, can I reach my, my service? For example, if you have a proxy in front of it, can I reach the service without the proxy? So maybe the proxy is down. So you can easily pinpoint and see like, oh, 
my app is fine, but it's not reachable because it's the proxy. And having these checks can pinpoint quite easily where that is. Um, you can again see the latency. Is it like the, the, the latency of the application on localhost fast? So it's a network issue or it's somewhere for, or it's a service issue when the service is slow in general. You could also check, for example, is my database up and did I configure the firewall on the database server correctly that that connection is also working in, the, in terms of health check. Um, so you can check from different angles where stuff is failing and then hopefully figure out quite quickly <laughs> why things are in the right state or in the wrong state. So one thing I didn't do so far is I didn't introduce, introduce myself um, which I always kept for, the, for later because I'm, I don't think I'm so important or so interesting. But why am I talking about that? I work for Elastic, the company behind Elasticsearch. We, we have like health checks like that and we also use them a lot internally. And that's kind of like where this entire idea of a talk came from. So how we look at health checks or what we can do is we have a component that can do health checks, which we call Heartbeat, which is the worst name of things in the world because everything is called heartbeat. And for example, for Linux services, if you call something heartbeat, you have five other things there called heartbeat. So we, we, shouldn't, we should have picked a different name, but that's kind of like what we were doing. And here this is showing very simply like how you could have these different checks implemented um, where, for example, I check with ICMP is the, the host available in general. And I just ping it. Um, every five seconds, for example, with a cron syntax. Um, and I, I run a TCP check against my database to check is MySQL and Postgres reachable. This one is only TCP because it doesn't speak HTTP. Or is my, my status page on my, my website available? And I check that every five seconds to, to see if those are up. And just signals like that are very cheap to run. Like if you do that every five seconds or 30 minutes or whatever, um, you don't need to keep the data for very long but they do give you a very quick overview of how things behave. Um, I'll show you the thing live um, in a bit. Um, you could make your health checks a bit um, smarter and go deeper. For example, here I have something that where I can add something and I can do a post um, where I actually post whatever data there and I'm expecting a 200 back and the next page after that should say saved. Um, so you can actually simulate flows to some degree and do that. Um, just to show you that um, quickly live, I, do you want to see the code first or the outcome? Code? Yeah, it's, it's always code, right? Is that large enough for you to read? Yes, kind of? Um, okay, so um, I kept it very simple. So I'm I'm taking DEFCONF CZ every 10 seconds, um, and I, I want to test that page. I also take the HTTPS page to see is it reachable through HTTPS and is the certificate um, valid. Um, and then it actually turns out um, that this is only a redirect at this point, and you're actually being taken to DEFCONF info. Um, and I take that page, wherever my cursor is. Um, I check that every sec 10 seconds. Um, I expect the 200 back here. Um, and you can also, for example, in the body, you can say, it should have Bruno and community conference, uh, but I don't want to have the term promotion on there, otherwise my, my page will fail. And then I, <coughs> sorry. Um, I'm also adding a bit of metadata. Basically, I check, say like, where I'm, where I'm running this from, um, and at the, at the very, very bottom. Um, I also say where I'm running this from. So this is running on, on my laptop and we could draw it out on a map so we could, if you have multiple pinger locations, you could see stuff like that and compare latency and everything. Um, so how does that look like? Is that also large enough for everybody to see? Um, I, so we can actually switch that to the last 15 minutes where this was running and everything worked. Um, we could also switch it to the last, I don't know, two hours or so, because then I was trying out stuff and things were failing, so we can also see things failing. Um, these are some of the monitors that I've configured. So for example, we have the HTTP and HTTPS DEFCON CZ, and they are okay. It also shows me when the TLS certificates are expiring. Um, 
you also have a dedicated page for that here where you could see um, from this check, we basically picked up the TLS certificate and this one is three days old and this one is 29 days old and it's valid until, well, we have some more months so we don't need to be too worried. But you could then just slap an alert on top of those and get say like 15 days before the, they expire, you get an email and you, you should probably start replacing those if it's not working automatically. In the uptime, um, we could look into one of those here, for example, here. Um, it tells me that this is working so far and it's up and it's running from my philip at devconfc set um, node. Um, we can actually go into the alert, see over time, so at some point I, I changed the name because I think philip at was easier to <coughs> understand than devconf again in the context. You can see how the, the latency for the response times developed over time. I'm not sure why they're spiking a bit here, but it's conference Wi-Fi after all, so I'm positively surprised that it's working so stably. Um, the other thing that you really see here that by default a redirect is considered successful in my tests. So for example, if I change that to expect a 200, my test would fail. Um, I'm not recording the, the body here, but you could also record the, the body, but I mean the, the 203 bytes uh, of the redirect itself are not super interesting. Um, the one with the body is, well, here I had it misconfigured because I had it without the www dot, which is another redirect that is set up, uh, but I expected the 200 to come back. Um, so you can put it together the, the right way, and if you, I don't know, if we scroll down here, you can see down here, we got a 300 two back, but we were expecting a 200, so it was initially failing, and well, the HTML was basically this is a redirect um, and it worked as expected in terms of testing um, that it failed here but then I fixed my test and since then those have all been green and just test as they should. Um, okay. One other thing that is interesting in that context is synthetic monitoring. Um, I guess everybody has seen health checks and is doing health checks one way or another. Um, is anybody doing synthetic monitoring or synthetics one? Okay, so synthetics are, the, the basic idea is you are simulating the browser and you do more action. And then sometimes um, I get the comment that, oh, this is a new fancy name for something that we've been doing for decades um, or some people have been doing, they just never knew what to call it. Uh, but using or simulating the end user is it's not exactly a new thing, though synthetic monitoring is a concept that as a term, I guess, is not as old. And the way how most people or many people are implementing it is Playwright. Has anybody used Playwright before? It's, um, it's a way to write JavaScript code basically to, to test your pages. Um, what it looks like is something like this. Um, so you could um, import Playwright and then you say, um, go to whatever page um, and then on that page click a button or expect there is a, a new to do element placeholder and then expect, I don't know, what needs to be done um, thing. So you can really simulate the, the user and the idea of synthetic monitoring is basically you don't just want to get a 200 back but you want to simulate the flow of your users. So if you, let's say you're a web shop and the most important flow in your, thi in your web shop is somebody put something into the the, the cart and then checks out and that's the most important flow and if you break that you don't want your users to tell you that you have broken two days ago the, 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 the checkout process but you want something to continuously run through those main steps to be sure whatever changes that is still working. So that is kind of like the idea of synthetics that rather than waiting on your users to shout something is broken you have the most important flows you constantly test those like every bless you, um, every five minutes or so, you test those yourself. So no matter what database is down or what you deploy, that main flow is always working and operational for you. Um, I'll show you that in action in a moment. Um, so you can either write the code to do that, and it looks something like this, so you can write that. Many people will say, we don't want to write check, click that button and search if there is an ID with that name and extract that value. Um, so there's also a, a way to basically 
um, record you clicking around in the browser and it will just extract the rules. Um, and there are multiple implementations of doing that. I think Playwright is one of the more active or well-maintained things right now. It's mostly driven by Microsoft, um, but Playwright is quite widely used in that browser simulation testing environment and you can use that. So I have, without writing much code or anything, I have enabled two monitors. So I, I'm just checking dev conf info um, from two different locations. So I'm running this, this from Germany and the uh, US. And I guess you can already see, I assume the data center where this site is running is in the US because the latency there is much lower than, <coughs> sorry, um, from Europe. Um, and then, I mean, we, we could add as many flows as we wanted to. But here um, you see, this is the site tested from these diff two different locations. And you can see um, how the, the test looks like. We can actually go to that monitor, see if these were all the iterations um, that we ran on that page. Um, I'm basically only going to the, to the main page and display that right now to keep it very simple. So you could edit the monitor and then you can either upload the script, you can write whatever steps you would want to have in here. Um, so we could also change that to www dot, which is the right one. And then, I don't know, we could go to um, CZ directly and then I can run this test. This will take a moment until the test runs through. Um, so you can simulate it right away. And once you're satisfied with the changes you have made, you can save it and then store that. Um, Okay, this looks good. Um, I'll update my monitor. Um, the next run will, will do that. Um, but I actually wanted to get back in here. Um, you can see basically a screenshot every time we ran this. And what is actually also nice is you can see all the simple steps. So for example, if you have 20 steps in your workflow, it will take a, a screenshot and show you how long did it take to do each one of these steps and you could do all of this, see all of the steps here. Um, you can also see then in terms of weight of the page, like the DEF CONF page, like what are uh, the dependencies and what are you loading? Um, so how fat is the page? Where did you spend your time? And it also knows the main Google metrics like large content full paint, um, et cetera. So it can extract all of that from the flow that you have shown um, and it will tell you um, well the weight and the timing and how long all of that took. Um, so it does make testing, or it takes testing quite a bit further than just like checking if it, the server is returning at 200, uh, but you can get to the, the outcomes of, of that test. So to wrap up, um, the two main concepts I think here are the health checks, which are cheap, fast, and give you a good overview and they don't need a lot of data. So everybody's talking nowadays of observability. Observability is normally quite expensive. I think a rule of thumb that many people have around observability is that 10% of your entire infrastructure cost should go into observability because that's like full instrumentation and monitoring everything will take that much overhead um, in terms of like storing the data, extracting it, processing it. Health checks in comparison are very small and cheap to run and can give you decent value. They don't normally are very good at telling you why something broke, but they're very much on this classic monitoring side to tell you something is broken and you should take a look at that. And that is kind of like the addition. You can then, once you know something is broken, you can look at logs, metrics, traces, whatever other information you have collected. But there's a first step. The health checks are often a good indicator something is wrong and you want to fix something in your system. Um, once you want to go further and you have like these main user flows, flows established that you always want to test that are more complex than just a 200 return, then you could do something like synthetics where you play through the same steps um, also maybe compare it to a week ago, it took one minute to run through this, now it takes um, one and a half minutes. You probably deployed some code that is slower, you have some calls that are, are taking longer. So you can use that for checking your own, so checking correctness, but also checking speed and kind of like drift in development and what has changed over time. Um, and that's it. Now it's time for everybody's questions and your own horror stories if you want to.
Any questions? Do we support only playwright? Um, so in, in our product where we have kind of like embedded all of this, yes, we only do support playwright at now, right now. Though, for example, I mean, Elastic is also more of a, a platform. So if you, if you have anything else and that spits out logs, ideally JSON or something like that, you could just throw it in and then build your own visualizations. You won't have like as fancy dashboards that are pre-built because that's kind of like tightly packaged together. Uh, so yeah, we have picked Playwright. What, what were you thinking in terms of alternatives to Playwright? Uh, Selenium. Selenium, okay, yes. So I, I think Selenium is kind of like the, the first or classic one that started a long time ago. Yes, though, so, um, I mean, the uh, Playwright is kind of client side as well, or it can be. So you can, so I ran that in a centralized way from, from a cloud instance, but you can have your own runners wherever you want with Playwright as well. So I think while, while there are some differences between Selenium and Playwright, um, it's, I would say, a very similar type of tool. It's just like the, the syntax and implementation is, is different. Um, I think Selenium is, how old, 10, 15 years at this point? Yeah, which is not too, I mean, it's part of the success that it has survived so long. But I think there are some things that are, I don't know, more cutting edge or hipper around Playwright uh, that changed, which is not to dis detract from Selenium. It's, I think, still, I always say it's the, the Jenkins of, of client-side testing. And then people are never sure if to, to take that as a praise or insult around Jenkins. But um, that's a different discussion. <laughs> you also use Jenkins. Well, it's tried and tested, and I can also say from our side, um, getting off of Jenkins is a very big task once you are heavily invested into it, but that's also another discussion. Um, any other comments or questions? What is my favorite Harry Potter movie? Favorite Harry Potter movie? <laughs> um, that is slightly unexpected now. I think I, I personally enjoy the later, darker ones more. I feel like there is a very strong progression for people that grew up with them, that the first ones are more like kid-like and the later ones got more adult or darker. And I was maybe a bit too old for them, but so I enjoy the, the later ones more. Yeah? Do we have any stories like, so any, any uncommon stories you mean for testing? How do you get the clean up statistics from So there, yeah, so that's actually a, a good point. So I, I think there are two components to that as well. So the, the synthetics are more like we simulate the user and we, we gather all their information. We, we do have another component to gather like the, what the end user is doing. It's I think normally called RUM, not the drink, but real-time user monitoring, which is like a JavaScript snippet that is injected into the browser. And then you can basically see what users are doing and there you can kind of like follow their weird behavior and learn what they've been up to. Whereas this is much more the proactive monitoring we, where we build some scenario to, to run through it. Did that kind of make sense? You were like, if you do uh, aggressive monitoring, then it will skew the statistics you get. Ah, sorry, it was about skewing. Sorry, I, ah, okay. Yeah, so the, the thing about the skewing is um, you should have a, a special header normally or something like that to filter out the data. Also, like when you do the, the flow to, to put it in the shopping cart, that you have a secret parameter that you pass and that is like, this is a test order and it will never hit the system. Uh, I don't think um, we, we had any occurrences where that went wrong, though I've also heard stories where people, yeah, where testing was basically taking down the system or faking, doing lots of fake orders because they, they forgot to, or somebody removed the check that this is a test order, um, which is kind of like a classic, but I, I'm not sure there's a, 
a solution for that, but unle unlike writing, or you can only write a very big comment like, please, this is important, otherwise bad things will happen. Um, but yeah, normally um, you should have a dedicated header or something like that, that your system can figure it out, and then you just filter it out. And what you even might want to do, for example, when, when we often set up like things like that, or for example with Jolokia, like some health checks, um, we would have a rule whenever we ingest even logs that we drop those logs because they're just noise. Um, so, so we normally try to, to have a, a feature flag because you don't want to see the, the logs and traces and anything of those test users anyway. It's, it's just garbage that your system would in, incorporate. Or it depends on how you treat it. Or you could just collect it and then put it in a separate bucket basically and filter it out. But yeah, you want to mark those um, I think it, that's also, for example, for tracing in open telemetry, that's also the recommendation to always have a dedicated header, and then you can just filter on the header um, to, to get rid of those. Sorry, I didn't get the question right at first. Anything else, or is it beer o'clock? So, sorry? It's always beer o'clock, yes. Um, it is always beer o'clock. Um, Thanks a lot for staying so long. Um, I'll see you at the social event later on. Thank you. <laughs>